Being that I am a B650 enthusiast and all that, I'm now dabbling in Chinese B650 motherboards. And what better place to start than the Jingyu Night Devil? A mini ITX board that costs just $93 US or $146 Aussie, which is what I paid for this one over on AliExpress. So it is super cheap, basically the cheapest AM5 motherboard you can get. So it's probably super crap, right? Well, before we find out, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Antec and their brand new C7 ARGB mid-tower ATX case. This beauty costs just $140 US and is available in either a black or white design. But whichever model you choose, you'll be able to view all of your glorious hardware thanks to a 270 degree panoramic display featuring 4mm tempered glass panels. But it's not just about the aesthetics, offering a multi-directional air intake design with fine mesh paneling. The C7 also supports up to 10 fans and simultaneous installation of 360 millimeter radiators in the top and side. Included are three 120 millimeter PWM and ARGB reverse fans, along with a single 120 millimeter fan in the rear. Also included is a controller that can synchronize lighting effects and fan speeds with your motherboard. Installations are breeze thanks to the screw free and clip handle design, while the back connect motherboard interface allows for easy cable management. There is much more to the C7 ARGB, so for more information, please check the link in the video description. So the B650i Night Devil, as we've already established, this thing is super cheap, and it's around $30 US cheaper than the absolute cheapest mini ITX AM5 motherboard in the market, which happens to be an A620 board, and it is this Gigabyte model here. It's not a particularly great board if I'm honest, and instead I would recommend the ASRock A620i Lightning Wi-Fi, which costs $140 US, so that's 50% more than the Night Devil. That being the case, I don't think we can expect too much from this board, so keep the price in mind, but let's take a closer look. Around the I.O. panel, which comes with a pre-installed shield, so that's a nice touch. There are four USB 3.2 ports, one of which is a Type-C, so again that's good and you get an additional two USB 2.0 ports. So you've got the basics covered there when it comes to USB stuff. You're also getting 2.5 gigabit LAN, which is nice. And while somewhat standard amongst B650 motherboards, there are cheaper MATX and ATX models that have been downgraded to gigabit. So keeping 2.5 gigabit on such an affordable motherboard is good to see. There's basic audio here with a pair of 3.5 millimeter jacks and optical out. And for display, you get DisplayPort and HDMI outputs. There's also a clear CMOS button, which I couldn't actually get to work, unfortunately. Maybe mine's broken. And then finally, there are two holes for a Wi-Fi adapter that you don't actually get. And on that note, while the board appears to come with Wi-Fi support, which is incredible at this price point, or at least it would be if it did indeed come with Wi-Fi support, which sadly it does not. This is a bit misleading. Actually, it's terribly misleading as all the photos of the board show Wi-Fi antenna connectors and the specs page lists Wi-Fi interface via M.2, which doesn't specifically state the board comes with Wi-Fi and rather that it supports Wi-Fi, though reading user reviews, it's quite clear that this caught a lot of people out. And in the buyer's defense, if you scroll down the product listing page, it says the board features onboard Wi-Fi and is equipped with a Wi-Fi bracket box. You do get the Wi-Fi bracket box, but not the Wi-Fi M.2 card, the bit that actually gives you Wi-Fi support. So this is something to be aware of. You will actually need to add in Wi-Fi support at an additional cost, should you need it. Now moving over to the board, there are two M.2 slots, which I love to see. Both are PCIe 4.0. That's a really great feature, given this is a mini ITX board and it is an ultra cheap mini ITX board at that. For example, the Gigabyte A620i AX, that only supports a single M.2 device, so getting a pair of M.2s on the Night Devil is really awesome. The primary M.2 slot also features a heatsink that cools both sides of the SSD, and both sides come with pre-installed thermal pads. This is a seriously nice touch at this price point. The only thing to note here is that the two screws that hold the heatsink down are done up extremely tight from factory. So make sure you have an appropriate size screwdriver for undoing them. Quite a few people have complained about rounding their heads here as these are cheap soft screws and they are done up incredibly tight. Though I don't believe you will round them if you have the right size bit. So again, make sure you have that before you apply a bit of pressure. 
Then on the rear side of the board, we have the second M.2 slot. And being that this is on the back side of the board, there is no cooling here. But the M.2 screw is pre-installed, so you don't have to go looking for it. And I have no idea why board makers don't always pre-install these screws. Why does a tiny M.2 screw need its own plastic bag? It just seems like such a waste. Then rounding out the storage are four SATA ports. Most AM5 Mini ITX boards only come with two SATA ports, so the Night Devil does quite well here. Then we see that the primary PCIe Time 16 slot is 4.0 compatible, and that's probably to be expected really. And with two DDR5 DIMM slots, the board does support up to 96 gigabytes of memory. For my testing, I used our G-Skill DDR5 6000 CL30 kit, and Loading Expo was an extra step or two than what you would see in a normal BIOS, let's say. And there was a bit of a run around there, which I'll talk about towards the end of the video. Something worth noting is that while all AM5 Mini ITX boards from the likes of MSI, ASRock, ASUS, and Gigabyte all feature three fan headers, the Night Devil gets just two. Now, of course, let's talk about the VRM. For the V-Core, you're getting eight 55 amp Alpha and Omega power stages. They're the Alpha and Omega AOZ5516 QI power stages. It's a decent configuration and should be enough for Ryzen 7 processors. They're also cooled via a rather large heatsink, though it's not that big in terms of mass and the surface area isn't huge, but it's still a decent heatsink for a very budget board. Finally, the board appears to be built on an eight layer PCB. I had to sand down the edge to learn this and I don't recommend you do this as it can damage the board. Okay, so let's quickly take a look at the BIOS and as you'd probably expect, it is very basic. And in terms of design, I certainly wouldn't call it pretty. Upon loading into the BIOS for the first time, everything will be in Chinese, which makes sense as this is a Chinese market product, but thankfully you do land on the system language option, though unless you read Mandarin, you probably wouldn't know it. Anyway, step one is to hit enter and select English, and be aware every time you reset the BIOS or the CMOS, you will have to do this step again. Also, the menu titles, they remain in Chinese, so you can't change that does make navigation a little bit tricky at first once you work out the menus, not too much of a problem. And for now we want to head to the menu with the little rocket ship, at least that's what I think it is. So I'm, I'm going with that little rocket ship. And the rocket ship menu has two options, memory OC and AMD overclocking. We want the memory OC menu and it's here that you can load memory profiles. First, you need to select XMP or Expo, and this will depend on what profiles your memory has, but with either XMP or Expo selected here, nothing is actually loaded yet. And this is because you then need to select the Active Memory Timing Settings option and then change it from Auto to Enable, at which point you can then select XMP or Expo, but more crucially, you can finally load a memory profile. This is a bit janky and there are multiple unnecessary layers here, but once you work it out, it's easy enough to navigate, I guess. And once that's done, you might also want to enable resizable bar, especially if you have a Radeon GPU, as this option is not enabled by default, whereas it is on all other AM5 motherboards from the likes of Asus, ASRock, MSI, and Gigabyte. Other than that, all the expected options and settings appear to be available on this board. It all just looks a bit dated for a 2024 BIOS. Now for testing VRM thermals, I'm using the Thermaltake Tower 100 Mini ITX case and for cooling the Noctua NHD15 Chrome Max Black. Then for recording temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples and I'm reporting the peak PCB temperature and I'm not reporting Delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees, and to ensure a constant ambient room temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. As for the stress test, I'm using the Ryzen 9 7950X, and for load at Cinebench 2024, which was looped for an hour, at which point I'm reporting the maximum PCB temperature. Again, recorded using K-type thermocouples. Okay, let's get into the results. The B650i Night Devil has no power limits, which is good, but it does mean that with the 7950X it ran very hot, hitting 121 degrees. And although performance was slightly down on the more premium boards, no CPU throttling was detected during our testing. The CPU wasn't boosting quite as high as it does on the more premium boards, but that doesn't mean throttling was occurring, because again, it wasn't. It's a bit interesting to see how hot this board does get, it's clearly something to do with the design of the power plane. Obviously, being a very affordable motherboard, some corners were cut there. 
and unfortunately power reporting was incorrect with this board so i did take a look at total system draw which was similar to boards reporting a package power of 200 watts and yet despite that the night devil claimed a package power of just 117 watts which isn't possible so there's an error in the reporting there I have ordered some hardware that will allow me to better validate those power readings, but for now we will have to use total system usage as a rough guide. And this configuration, the system was consuming 330 watts, which is just 20 watts less than that of our ATX AM5 test system. So it does appear as though the B650i Night Devil isn't power limiting the Ryzen 9 processor. And this is of course also evident by this score of 19,089 points which was reported at the end of our hour long stress test. And that's just a one and a half percent reduction in performance when compared to the ASRock A620i Lightning Wi-Fi. And what all this means is if you plan on pairing the B650i Night Devil with something like a Ryzen 5 7500F, it will work very well. And the future upgrade options won't be that limited either. For reference, I installed the Ryzen 7 7700X and this saw the peak VRM temperature hit 81 degrees, which is still a very warm temperature for a 105 watt part, but it worked and I'd have no issues running an all core workload for an extended period of time with something like a 7700X on this board. Finally, here's a quick comparison with other AM5 Mini ITX boards that I've tested. And as you can see, on paper, the B650i Night Devil stacks up pretty well. Sure, it does run a little bit hot with flagship processors, but it still runs. And in terms of features, the basics are well covered here. Minus wireless networking, of course, but you do get two M.2 slots. and That's a pretty big win in my opinion. In terms of features, the B650i Night Devil, it's impressive given what it costs, but the board can also be a bit janky. Memory compatibility seems to be a little bit too limited and many of the kits I tried resulted in that dreaded blue screen of death either loading windows or once under load. Unfortunately, my standard G-Skill DDR5 6000 CL30 kit that I use for testing wasn't stable, though I did manage to get a similar kit working. The standard kit uses CL30 38 38 38 primary timings, and this just wouldn't work. We have another G-Skill Trident Z5 DDR5 6000 kit that runs at CL30 40 40 40, and that did work. But getting it to work was a bit of a runaround and ultimately I'm not sure why it wasn't working initially and then ended up actually working. So I suspect you're very likely to end up with a few headaches when it comes to memory and this motherboard. I also noticed that there are a few other YouTubers who had purchased this board and also reported similar stability issues when trying to run DDR5 6000 memory as well as stability issues in general. So given that alone, I'd be hesitant to buy this motherboard. Though the situation could improve with future BIOS updates, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But before I do, as a side note, it's worth noting that many of the seller pages on AliExpress for this board feature loads of five-star reviews with no real feedback. Some look very fake in my opinion, while a few look legit. That said, there seems to be just as many one-star reviews as there are legit five-star reviews. So keep that in mind, and I'm not an AliExpress expert, so it might just be my ignorance here, but those suspect-looking five-star reviews, they give very scummy vibes to me. Now, the key draw card here is the price. At a smidgen over $90 US, it's really hard to go past, especially for budget builders. But other than the price, it has little over a board such as the ASRock A620i Lightning Wi-Fi, other than CPU overclocking thanks to the use of the B650 chipset, which may or may not appeal to you. Outside of that though, the ASRock board is better, and in many respects, for just $50 US more, it is a heck of a lot better. Firstly, there's stuff like the warranty. Now, I have no idea what kind of warranty, if any, I'm getting with the Night Devil. I've done some digging online, read some user experiences, and it's hard to get an accurate read on what the situation is there. And it does seem to vary depending on the region, but what I can say is the warranty is anything but guaranteed. I've read quite a few reports online from people who have had defective motherboards purchased from AliExpress, who paid to send the board back. And it was agreed upon with the seller that once the board was sent back, it would be replaced, but the buyer had to pay for shipping both ways. But after doing that, they ended up getting nothing back. So they paid to send this thing back and that was end of story. So that's bad, but even if you were able to get the board back, having to pay the shipping costs both ways, 
I'm not saying that's unfair. It's just, it's not very cheap. In my example, I paid 26 Australian dollars for shipping. So that means it'd be about $50 if it was an option to get the board replaced. So not cheap. So if anything does go wrong, the Night Devil could end up costing me at least as much as the Azrock board once you factor in the shipping to have it replaced. And again, that's even if that's an option. Online reports don't make it sound like that's a guaranteed option at all. On the other hand, if I had have just gone and purchased the ASRock A620i Lightning Wi-Fi locally, I could either mail it back to the retailer at a fraction of the cost or deliver it in person and they'd carry out the full RMA process for me. And I absolutely would get back a working product in return. Moreover, here in Australia, MSI, Gigabyte, ASUS and ASRock all offer a three-year warranty. It's worth noting that the warranty is just one form of support. There's also ongoing support in the form of BIOS updates. In the case of the A620i Lightning Wi-Fi, ASRock has issued half a dozen BIOS updates since release, and support for Zen 5 processors was released to the public back in May of this year. Now, in the case of the Jingyu, like the warranty, I'm not exactly sure what to expect here. Over on their website, you'll find four BIOS revisions for the Night Devil, but very little information is given especially for important stuff like the AGISA code versions. As far as I can tell, the Night Devil doesn't yet support Ryzen 9000 series processors, and the product page still only claims Ryzen 7000 support. The most recent BIOS update was released back in April, so I doubt support for the 9000 series has been added yet. There's also a section for the board manual, but that goes nowhere. There's nothing there, so you can't download a manual for this board, or at least I couldn't at the time of making this video. The process of updating the BIOS is also a bit janky, at least when compared to brands such as ASRock for example. Firstly, and very disappointingly, there is no BIOS flashback type feature. So if you buy this board with a Ryzen 9000 series processor, and a BIOS has been released to support those upcoming parts, but is yet to be flashed on this board, well you're up that famous creek without a paddle. You'll have to get yourself a Ryzen 7000 series processor to flash the board, and then you'll be able to use your newer processor. Once you have a CPU to flash the board, you'll need to make a USB boot drive with the BIOS on it, as there isn't a utility within the BIOS to do this, like what you find with most of the brands, you know, ASRock, ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte. So if flashing a BIOS with those main brands is already a bit daunting for you, well, this is gonna be a real challenge. Most of the AM4 boards seem to support all AM4 processors, so that's good. But even so, I'm not sure what the future holds for the B650i Night Devil in terms of BIOS support. So there is some risk there. And I think that's the best way to summarize this product. It is risky. In my opinion, it's simply not worth the $50 US saving over something like the A620i Lightning Wi-Fi. Not when you will very likely keep the board for many years to come and we'll probably have the option to slot in a Zen 6 processor at some point. I see AM5 as a long-term investment. And I think getting a quality motherboard is key to seeing that investment pay off. That said, if you're really strapped for cash and you don't want to go AM4, the B650i Night Devil is the cheapest way to buy into the AM5 platform. And look, it is an enticing pairing for an AliExpress Ryzen 5 7500F. You just have to cross your fingers that nothing goes wrong with it. But given my issues, I'd probably suggest you avoid it. And that's going to do it for this video. If you liked it, well, do the like thing, subscribe, and we also have Floatplane and Patreon. Check those out if you're interested. If not, it's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.